Welcome courtside to College Game Day Basketball Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Pete Flamel, here with my colleague, Jeff Warzello, and we are live here in Glendale, Arizona, not particularly close to Phoenix, uh, where I would call this Appetizer Saturday, Jeff. We had two decent appetizers of semifinal games. The results were somewhat lopsided. The results were definitely expected. And I think the most pleasing part of Appetizing Saturday, other than the modestly competitive games, was that we got the national title game that everyone wants on Monday. Uh, We had Alabama losing to UConn, 86-72. We had Purdue out-muscling NC State, 63-50. And Jeff, how were your appetizers? They were good. I mean, like you said, they kind of went as expected. Um, And Alabama, to me, I... They kind of imposed their style a little bit more on UConn than I thought they would for about 25, mm-hmm. 30 minutes at least. But as we've seen time and time again, it's hard to do that for 40 minutes against UConn. Um, and so I think, like you said, we kind of got the game, the matchup on Monday that we really wanted. The Zach Eady, Donovan Klingon, can UConn go back to back for the, be the first team since Florida in 06, 07, or can Purdue pull a, a Virginia and go from 16 over one upset to a national title? Um, they've been probably the two best teams from start to finish the season, you know, Houston has um, obviously had their fair share of, of really good months this season, but I think UConn and Purdue, they had the most weeks at number one uh, in the AP poll. Uh, and I think that, you know, Purdue has been, you know, a storyline all season. Uh, you know, can Matt Painter get over the hump? Uh, you know, how dominant is Zach Eady? What's his legacy in the college game? And then the UConn has just been a, a it's been steamrolling teams for months now. Uh, so I, I think Monday night will be, a, a real fitting end to to the to the season. Yeah, I think it's the most anticipated national title game in my years covering the sport. Yeah. I think it's my twenty second final four. Uh, I, I could go back and maybe argue one or two others, but I really think this is sort of the the Titanic collision that mm-hmm. we've been looking for. And I think before we dive in too much, I think we have to reflect a little on our appetizers first, and we'll start with uh, the less satisfying appetizer that was Purdue sixty three. NC State 50, uh, c- kind of a, a weird win-ugly kind of game. Uh, Zach Eady was Zach Eady, right? 20 points, 12 rebounds, two blocks. He had four assists um, and just kind of steady Eddie through, through the storm. NC State had their moments. That, you know, DJ Horn was excellent. DJ Burns was not much of a factor, I would, I would say, in this, uh, in this game, which was, uh, which was too bad because obviously he's had – the best month of any player in college basketball in the, in, in the last month. Uh, your impressions, Jeff, of uh, of the of the early slog here in Glendale. Yeah, it, it was ugly. Um, you know, there was a, there was that six minute, seven minute stretch uh, in the first half where there wasn't a single whistle, and both teams were dragging uh, for a you know. It was like a nine minute, minute stretch. Yeah, it, it was, was wild. I mean, I'm surprised nobody just kind of committed an intentional foul just to stop the game. I mean. Burns was dragging. I mean, there were guards on NC State that were kind of moving pretty slow. And if if guards that are usually used to going up and down for for a long time are, are dragging, then you know it's it's really moving slowly. But it, it it you know like you said, Burns Burns needed to have a huge game for NC State to be competitive, and he just didn't. Um, you know, he had a, that stretch early where he picked up a couple of assists, and outside of that, he got a couple of fouls, and then he was kind of a passenger. The rest of the way, um, I think it was pretty telling that NC State's best stretch came when Ben Middlebrook, um, you know, the third big man in NC State's big man rotation, was the one guarding Edie. And Edie, I mean, he was fine. I mean, he had a, he kind of had a, I don't know, maybe 10 minute, 12 minute stretch where he wasn't really getting the ball in good positions, wasn't getting clean looks at the basket. But Purdue, I mean, when you combine him going for 20 with four assists, with Purdue's guard shooting 40% from three, making 10 threes. You know, regardless of how ugly you're playing and how, how much you're struggling to, to kind of take care of the ball and things like that, it's going to be pretty hard to to beat a team when you're playing like that. And so it wasn't a great game, but the outcome was pretty much just as we expected. Well, we do have one upset here on Final Four Saturday. Uh, Reese Davis has his tie loosened. He has joined us, <laughs> and it is very rare that you see Reese Davis without his tie Velcroed to his Adam's apple. So he's clearly uh, back at his hotel this is Reese Davis' version of cutting loose. He has about a he has about a quarter <laughs> inch between his uh, between his tie and his neck. So, what do you uh, think about just, that? Oh man, 
Uh, welcome, Reese, and I uh, appreciate you joining us on our little uh, basketball podcast here. Jeff and I were just uh, walking through the, uh, the the first game, and I, I will mm-hmm. ask your impressions of the uh, of the slog of Purdue out slogging <laughs> NC State in there. And you were with NC State for their run in DC, I believe, yeah. in all five games, right? Yes, so that's I'm right. Curious, maybe you can give us a little coda on uh, on that run ending because it was just one of the more remarkable March runs that we've seen. It, this tournament traffics, and you and I have talked about this, Pete, and hope and validation, and that also yeah. extends to the conference tournament in which you can play your way in. If if an 87% free throw shooter had made a free throw for Virginia, not only does North Carolina State not make the run to the Final Four, they're, they're probably breaking in a new coach. Uh, everybody's in the portal. They're looking at something totally different. Instead, they have a little momentum. Um, they have they have hope, and you know I, I think Kevin Keats is a really good coach. I think he's a good coach tonight. I think he was a good coach before they started that uh, ACC tournament run. But you have to have some momentum. This performance gave them some. Now it wasn't displayed against Purdue, so it was um, you know it was a terrific run, as Kevin said after the game. Running nine, uh, winning nine straight elimination games is extraordinarily difficult to cool. do. But in, in this game tonight, um, you know, I thought that I thought guarding Burns one on one and really saying, you know, we, we don't think you can do that against us. You're not going to cut us to pieces. The O'Connell injury certainly uh, changed things mm-hmm. a little bit for North Carolina State. I think Purdue wins the game anyway. But um, it was a, um, you know, even if, if Michael hadn't been hurt. But, you know, it was a remarkable run. They deserve a lot of credit. But uh, I said on Sports Center a little while ago, we talk about how unpredictable things are in the tournament. Well, there's still a couple of locks. One of the locks is the double-digit seeds that get to the Final Four are going to lose. And mm-hmm. the other one is first-time Final Four teams meeting uh, reigning champions in the Final Four. They, too, are going to lose. I think they're over 12. Uh, the other one is you – know, I've forgotten the number, but I think it's like uh, 0 for 6. 0 for 6 or 0 for 7 for 11 seeds making it to the Final Four. We teased a little bit early in the podcast before you joined us just about how this was appetizer Saturday and we're mm-hmm. excited for Monday. And we were just starting to go through the first game when you joined us. So I will I will allow you to take it from here, Reese. Well, no, I mean, I, I don't want to be redundant on it. But, I, you know, I thought something that was interesting that um, that Matt Painter said uh, last week because, you know, they, they shoot the ball from three extraordinarily well. They're second in the country, but they don't take a lot of them. They're bottom 100 in terms of attempts and percentage of shots that are threes. And he told, I think it was on the Rich Eisen show, maybe, uh, he, he told somebody, uh, we don't need, we're not one of those teams that need a lecture about who our best player is. You know, they, <laughs> they run it, you know, they run it through Edie. And I think that's one of the things that um, will be, and I don't want to spin us too far ahead to the championship game yet until we digest what we just saw. But, you know, they're, they're not going to get out of character against UConn. And even though, uh, you know, Zach might not have had the prolific 40 point game. He's still what the 20 and double figure rebounds, you know. So he's he's a force unlike any other. And even as good as Donovan Kling it is, uh, he's not Zach Eady yet. He's really good. Um, but but he's not that. And NC State just uh you know just wasn't you know wasn't able to do enough with him or with them and and Purdue shot right on the average of 40 percent. So if you are gonna um, you know, make them shoot threes. They're more than capable of knocking them down. They're much better at it this year than they were last year. How worried are you guys about how Braden Smith played? He uh, had five first half turnovers. turnovers. Yeah. He had, I think he started the game with something like 0 for 6. He hit a very key three-pointer that was kind of, but you could argue, iced the game. There were maybe two or three other shots mm-hmm. that you could say iced it. And I couldn't tell if the Purdue cheering section was so happy for him to shake off a shooting slump or that they were like, up 12 I'm making that number up it was something like that and we're going to win the game it was like both catharsis and joy in the same cheer um when when he finally did hit one uh late yeah I think it's for me it's two things I think it showed a the importance of or, or I guess the uh the x factor that Lance Jones has been the kind of the difference mm-hmm. maker from last season mm-hmm. and he gives them another guy who can dribble the ball who can bring it up uh you know when Brandon Smith's not playing well I mean NC State got into him the guards got into him and that was kind of the knock on him down the stretch last season is that he was having trouble dealing with pressure. He's done a lot better this season, but today, you know, he got into a little bit of a funk and, and Jones was able to take some of the pressure off of him by bringing it up, but spinning it forward just a little bit. 
if UConn uses Steph Castle on him like they did with Mark Sears today and they did with Boo Booey earlier in the tournament, I'm concerned about Purdue getting into their half-court offense. Um, you know, Edie wasn't getting the ball in his usual positions where he's three feet from the rim and can just turn and finish. And a lot of that has to do with Braden Smith bringing the ball up and getting Purdue into its offense and getting clean entry passes to Edie. If Castle can kind of can disrupt that and, and just throw off their timing just a little bit, it just makes it a lot tougher to get Edie the ball. And again, I mean, if you get him the ball eight feet away from the rim, that's a win for the defense because he can't he can't just turn and finish. He's got to do a little bit more, and that's where NC State could clamp down and, and knock the ball away and things like that. So I am a little bit concerned. Again, I mean, it's it's pretty telling that they kind of cruised without much of a sweat with him not playing well, but he's going to have to play a lot better on Monday. Uh, I'm only concerned with the turnovers. I'm not concerned in the least with the shooting. It was fine. He rebounded the ball, which he does really well for a guard his size, and he, you know, he still had half dozen assists. Turnovers, he, you, it can't happen Monday night. If they do, UConn will win by twenty. You know, if they give them, you know, open floor turnovers, turnovers for touchdowns, as uh, uh, Greenberg likes to call them. So I'm not. Everybody occasionally has an off shooting night. Uh, and certainly, I think a guy his size length is always going to bother him a little bit. You know, he's not not the biggest guy in the world. Um, but, you know, I, I'm the turnover. Probably Zach had some turnovers, too, and it's probably uh, attributable to what you talked about or maybe getting the ball in some uncomfortable positions. They they have to do a better job of that uh, against uh, against Connecticut on Monday night. But it. North Carolina State wasn't able to make them pay for it. It was, you know, Horn Horn was sensational, man. Did he make some tough Ooh. shots for them to really Ooh. keep them in the game? I mean, that, and the funny thing is, it's like the margins of victory in both games were about the same. Uh, Alabama UConn kind of felt close for a long time, and uh, and Purdue North Carolina State didn't feel close to me at all. I mean. Did, uh, did Purdue was their largest lead twenty? Maybe I think I think they got up by twenty. Yeah, they got one twenty. Point. Yeah, and we about two, three, little less than three left. Yeah, yeah. I thought there was there was a point when I was sitting there in the second half. And I looked up and I was like, "Wow, they NC State scored like fourteen points in the second half." And there, I think there were only like maybe three minutes left in the game or something like that. So they put a little window dressing on it at the end. You know, good for them. But they had a uh, you know Purdue clamped down on them really really well. And I'm I'm happy. You know, I'm really happy for Purdue to get to this point, making the second national championship game. Last time it was in the uh, UCLA dynasty era. But, you know, I've given them a lot of grief. You know, it's just hard fact that they'd lost to a 13, 15, 16, all as a big favorite. And then they get here and they're facing an 11, which, okay, ACC tournament champion, Cinderella, Glass Zipper, still an 11. You know, if you so if you lose that game, even though I – I wouldn't view it the same way with it being a final four and with it being a team that actually won the ACC tournament. Um, but it still would have gone on the list, like it or not, you know? So I'm, I'm happy that I, I'd said last week, I felt like the baggage had been shed. Now, now it's been stored away. Now they, they play <laughs> a great team. They either win or lose, you know, and there's no, um, you know, if they play their best game, they'll have a chance to win. Um, so, you know, I, I'm actually happy that they've been able to to get rid of some of that and, and reach this point. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, just obviously the, the the arc of Purdue sort of trying to do to re boomerang the Virginia, I guess we can call it right now, from the losing you, to the 16 to, to you know, you know, back. Jeff, you guys know Jeff Brown, I guess, the game oh, day yeah. college basketball producer, Geoff, call, Virginia Jeff. Call, yeah. yeah, I call him Cat, I call him Cavman. Because he he you know loves the Virginia Cavaliers, he loves shot clock violations, he loves everything <laughs> about them, and he he does he does not want Purdue to do this. He's like he's like that's ours. We did that. <laughs> we lose the UMBC. I mean, it's not anything against Purdue. He just doesn't want Virginia to have to share that distinction. Like if you're like I worked years ago on the old NBA Tonight show with Fred Carter. Fred Mad Dog Carter was on that Philadelphia 76ers team, I think in 1972, I believe it was. They went 9 and 73. And any time a team would threaten that record when I was worried, he did not want them to break it. He, you know, you would think you would want somebody to win eight games to get you off the hook there. He's, Fred would always say, You can't be the best, might as well be the worst. <laughs> so, you know. I guess uh, some Virginia fans want to own that distinction as theirs and theirs alone. 
Well, the the other distinction I think we're waiting on, Reese, is that the, the UConn double here, and it mm-hmm. is certainly not inevitable or imminent, but it is you know six and Likely. a half points highly probable, yeah. right, um, mm-hmm. or probable in in that. But there are certainly a lot of scenarios where where they where they could lose. Uh, what do you guys make of the, the the big man matchup, and 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 really, I think the guard matchup, as Jeff hinted at earlier with Castle, uh, maybe a little bit more telling. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's. It, Obviously, Edie is further along in his development than Klingon is. Um, and we've seen it a couple times this season. Klingon can get in foul trouble, which Edie has done a tremendous job of avoiding pretty much throughout his career. Uh, and so I think that's going to be the big thing uh, on Monday. You know, if Klingon picks up two quick fouls, suddenly the game is completely changed. Um, and, and one stat I noticed was Edie averages the same exact amount of points in their wins as losses. Exact 25 points a game in four losses, 25 points a game in 34 wins. And so I think that, and you know, I'm sure Dan Hurley and his staff are aware of it. Edie's going to get his either way. Um, it's going to be more important for Klingon to stay on the floor than it is to contest every Edie layup. If he's out of position, he's going to get a bucket. Let him have it. You know, stop everyone else. The Edie twos are not going to, uh, you know, beat UConn if that's all they get. Um, and so I, I think that's going to be the biggest thing is that Klingon has to be disciplined. He's done a really good job in the tournament of kind of just walling up, staying straight, staying vertical, and not fouling. Uh, you know, I, I guess Illinois fans might might disagree with some of that. Uh, see, they were complaining on a lot of his blocks in the Elite Eight game. But um, that's going to be the biggest thing is is if Klingon stay on the floor, because if you go to Samson Johnson, it's just not a physically. It's just a different matchup. Um, you know, Samson Johnson is tall and long and everything. But um, Klingon is, is the best interior defender in the country. And he's really proven that in the NCAA tournament. And now he's going against you know, I, it's all it, to me. It's the best college player in eating and the best NBA prospect in college in Klingon. Um, and on Monday night, you know, Edie could win the matchup, but if Klingon stays on the floor and just stays out of foul trouble and can impact the game in other ways, I think UConn wins. You know, in a matchup of big men, uh, we, in this era of college basketball, you're not seeing as much of that as in, you know, the olden days. You know, you think back and this certainly doesn't rival Ewing against Olajuwon, uh, and probably not even, you know, like Weber Montrose. Um, you know, but maybe – you know, maybe it's not too far from the, um, uh, you know, from Florida's big man, Joe Kim Noah and, and Al Horford against Greg Oden. Yep. You know, maybe Ooh. maybe it's something, you know, maybe it's something like that in terms of um, battle of battle of bigs, which you don't see <clears throat> as much, especially two that that could be good. But I do think it's going to be it's going to be decided by by the outside. And, um, you know, Purdue has an answer that Alabama didn't have. And, you know, speaking of fouls, Grant Nelson got fouled when he put Klingon on poster two tonight. But, you know, those bigs and Edie, um, you know, Edie also, Tennessee fans would tell you, he he gets away with quite a bit. It was really funny. I don't know if you guys saw on game day today, I made some crack about that, about the three-second lane. And um, and they, they sort of got snarky and chastised me, Bruce Pearl, joined us later and made the same comment. And I said, I'm, I'm proud of you guys for being nice to a guest when he comes on here. You know, I said, you know, they were saying how hard it was to officiate Edie is what happened. I said, well, I think we need to be able to count on the officials to count three, at least one of the three times, you know? <laughs> so it's, um, you know, and I was, I was being facetious and joking, but it, it will be a tough game to officiate because I think sometimes officials fall into things with these big guys is depending on who they are, they either get too touchy with them because they, they're not trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, or they let them get away with uh, with murder because they're like, well, they're, they're just big, they're standing there, they're you know, they just bang the guy a little bit or whatever. So it, it'll be a how that game is officiated will be a big deal, I think, for for both of those guys. They let them just. I hope they don't let them just turn it into a wrestling match inside. I hope they, uh, you know, I hope they keep some order. Can we be undisciplined for a minute here, Reese? Well, so that's last uh, talkative and undisciplined. Talking yes, about discipline. Sure. That's the, that's the mantra of our broadcast. So last night, Jeff Borzell and I were enjoying dinner uh, at a at a local establishment, sitting at the bar, watching the uh, watching the 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 women's game and the the UConn Iowa ending. There was obviously mm. that mm. very controversial foul call. Mm. I, being the joyless buzzkill that I am, <laughs> said, "You know what? If you're going to call it eight minutes into the game, you got to call it in the final 100%. minute." And 100%. I, I thought it was a foul. So Borzello kills me for like a, a big foul guy. How oh, you're a big foul guy. He came for the ref show, the whole thing. Could you or could you be the arbiter and, and say, was was that a foul on the screen? Leaning in the 
a foul is called. Oof. Early leaning and the foul is called. I did not think so. I didn't oh, think it was. I, I didn't think it was enough. But I do agree with you in principle. <laughs> I I I hate 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 when people say you can't call that there. Yes, you can. If it's a foul, call it because if somebody's gaining an advantage or disadvantage, just as they would at the eight minute mark or in the final possession. Uh, I didn't think that rose to the level of of a foul. She moved a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. You know, but. Uh, I think at some point. Did you see the slow mos that came today? The Zap Rooters? Yeah. The SVP came out and said he changed his mind. I changed my mind a little bit. I changed my mind a little bit on it. I mean, it, but in real time, in real time, I didn't think that it was a foul. And that's when the refs called it. So SVP changed his mind from no foul to yes foul. And he said he came around when he saw some of the uh, some of the slow-mo footage. I'm going to send you one of the slow-mos uh, on text right now, Reese. I'm going to pull it up. This is this is really good podcast stuff right here. I'm pulling <laughs> it up on my phone and looking at it as we as we do this. Um, I, it would have been great if somebody asked Dan Hurley his opinion on that because we know if the one thing Dan yeah. Hurley has opinions on, it's officiating. Those opinions are relentless. It was funny watching the Alabama people watch Dan Hurley because they had clearly never seen like him coach. Like, uh, like <laughs> how about how about him? How about him calling for a flop? I've forgotten who it was when like somebody like, took their arm and did a single arm drag takedown. Um, but yeah, it was hilarious. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm watching this in 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 slow in slow motion. I can see how this would change your mind. Um, yeah. Now, what I yeah, there's no there's no question in slow motion. If you watch it now back to back full and see how much uh, how much it yeah. is. Uh, but I I think you know the first angle that you saw most of the time is that the left arm doesn't extend on it, which would have made it an easy. Foul call. Well, sure. You know, yeah. and but but yeah, that 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 left foot is down late. So I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna give you that. I would like to see it in fast motion. I did not think it was a foul at the time when I when I caught it. And this coming from a guy who I I don't want to see a free throw contest. I don't want to see the ref show and the foul show, but I do want freedom of movement and I want offense. I want people sure. to get up and down the floor and score. I don't want, you know, I don't want to see wrestling matches. I don't want to see people hold the ball. I don't want to see Cutter's chuck, which, you know, that was a defender chuck there. So I'd like to see it again, but that one will that one will make you think a little bit differently about it for sure. So I'm also pro IRS and pro meter made too, from <laughs> according to Borzello last night. So. <laughs> I enjoyed a good trip to the dentist. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't we all? You know the the you guys want to talk about the second game a little bit too? I yeah, mean, let's talk about yeah. I mean, man, about okay. it was a fun man, game. Man, like, for a blowout, man. it was a fun game. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it wasn't really blowout until like the last what three minutes yeah. or whatever yeah. it was. It yeah. got stretched out at the end when you know Alabama kept answering and then finally didn't have any more answers because. UConn always has some more answers. Um, whether How about that set play out of the timeout? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just I mean, time and time again, they Smooth jazz. Yeah, both. I mean, you know, both those coaches are super ultra elite. I mean, <laughs> that, that was that was some high level back and forth and answering players making uh, making guys make adjustments and you know, daring Stephon Castle to shoot didn't work out quite as well as daring. Uh, L.A. Cadeau and Seth Trimble to shoot, um, you know, but it was something that, you know, they had done previously. But UConn did such a good job. It wasn't – I mean, the Alabama shot a fine percentage. Alabama, I think, if I remember the box score correctly, attempted 23 threes. Uh -huh. yep. they, needed to attempt, they needed to attempt about 43 threes, and UConn didn't let them. Now, to Alabama's credit, they didn't just, you know, jack up a bunch of bad shots and get themselves blown out in the first half. But they needed to be able to create more threes. And UConn, even though Alabama was making them in the first half at a pretty high clip, I thought the most impressive thing was that they didn't let them attempt a whole bunch of them. I'm not sure that they're bigs that they brought off the bench. I'd have to look at the box score again. But Stevenson and Walters, I'm not sure they even got one up. And, nope. and both of those guys, especially Stevenson and the Clemson game, have been huge. 
it's just another example of how well coached, how diverse, how deep, how many answers, how many different guys, how many different ways to beat you that they have. I don't it, – it's really funny. I watch them, and I think they're the best team I have for quite some time. I think they're going to win Monday night, and it's it will be historic. I can't quite put my finger on the why I don't look at them and say, well, I think they're you know better than the than the great Duke teams, or I don't think they're you know I don't know that I even think that they're better than some of the Hooners, uh, you know the Hooners ninety nine or two thousand fourteen. I'm not sure I think they're better than them. Yet, yeah, man, oh man, I mean, I don't know why I wouldn't think that. What what do you guys think when you watch them from an historical context of? if they are to be champions again. They're deep. They've got every answer in the book. They've got a giant in the middle. They've got shooters. They've got grit. They've got, you know, they, they've got uh, guys who can drive and go get you a bucket. And I look at the accomplishment potentially as being one of the greatest in the modern era of college basketball. I'm not sure that I think if I lined them up, you know, against uh, – you know, some of the other great championship teams of you know, the last 25 years. I'm, I'm not sure I put them right at the top. I mean, certainly close to it. What, what do you think? From a talent perspective, I think you're probably right. I mean, they're not filled with five lottery picks and and a bunch of, of you know, future first rounders. things. I mean, they Klingon and, and Kassler are first rounders, and, and that's probably it. Um, but to me, it's really hard to argue against what they've done this season. I mean, they've lost once fully healthy. And that was yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not arguing yeah. against that. Not, yeah. not at all. I'm not. I'm not arguing their accomplishment for a second. Yeah, I. I, I but I think from the, because when you when people will look back at at the best teams ever, you're going to line up their starting five. I mean, the Florida teams, all those the, that starting five is very recognizable. You know, they did it twice. You know, obviously not all of them were future NBA players, but a lot of them, three of them, had had pretty substantial NBA careers. I think you guys still doing it. Don't put them right, in the He is still playing. That's I, fair enough. You get a ring in Boston yeah. this year. Yeah, you know, uh-huh. I think they, I, I think there are some real similarities there, and that's yeah. where I was going to go with those, with those Florida teams. There, that great teams, you know. But you don't look at them, and you don't, don't know if you see, you know, Ben Gordon and Emeka Okafor. Uh, you know, just to use UConn, you don't see uh, Jay Williams, Mike Dunleavy, and Shane Battier. You know, although I know they didn't go back to back, but a championship team. Um, I mean, that's what I'm talking about, and sort of what you're saying about maybe that level of of star power, but I do think the, the Florida comparison to maybe they'll match that achievement are, are pretty, pretty comparable. I think. I, I think like, to me, like the, the, the dominance of their run is, is similar to 2018 Villanova where nobody's really laying a, a finger on them at all. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're rarely sweating and it's, you know, you always just sort of assume they're going to win. Even when Alabama had the five point lead in the first half, you just kind of assume, okay, eventually you kind of figure it out. Um, and that team, although they had, I mean, Jalen Brunson's incredible and Bridges is good, but you know, it was, it was, you know, guys, like DiVincenzo and Eric Pascal and Omari Spellman and Phil Booth. Um, it wasn't an overwhelmingly talented team, but they were incredibly well coached. They were efficient on off. I mean, they just laid teams under a barrage of three pointers. UConn doesn't do it that way, but mm-hmm. as we saw last week, they can go on a 30 0 run and, and teams just don't have an answer for it. It's, <laughs> I, I, I kind of consider those two teams to be pretty similar. I just – they're no, the, a good, maybe the two comparison. most successful and most efficient teams I've seen uh, in my years covering this. And, again, th- there's that feeling of inevit- inevitability that, you know, they don't ever get rattled. And that's kind of what I wrote about tonight is that when Alabama kept coming, kept looking like they had momentum, UConn even keeled. They would come down. And they just have supreme confidence in what they do at both ends of the floor. Last week against Illinois, it was when they were tied at – you know, minute left in the half. Eventually, our shots are going to start going in. Today, Alabama, they made nine of their first 12 threes. Eventually, those shots are going to stop falling. And they just kind of stay the course, do what they do. They know that, in general, they're better than whoever they're playing against. And in the end, it's all going to work out. And and that's kind of the way I remember Villanova carrying themselves in, in 2018, where, you know, they were just – they never really got rattled. They never got too high, too low. And they just – they overwhelm teams and, and I don't think Villanova had a close game in that tournament in 2018. They won that title game by 17. I don't know if, if UConn is going to beat Purdue by 17, but that's kind of the team I, I kind of like to compare them to um, not an overwhelmingly lottery pick filled team, but just a really, really, really good college basketball team. 
Hey Pete, how about how about this? Tonight after the game, we start on Sports Center, and one of the things that um, that Seth and I had been talking about a lot, Seth Greenberg and I had been talking about a lot, is how would you kind of uh, respond when challenged or when they got mm-hmm. in a close game, when they got in a tight one? And so Seth starts laying out, and and rightfully so, four different times in the game where UConn got pushed, would have had the opportunity maybe to tighten up, but instead responded. This is how dominant UConn is. Alabama led that game for, I think, what, four minutes and uh-huh. 20 seconds or 28 seconds, something like that, which that's it. That that means they barely led the game. Yet it was about four minutes longer than UConn had trailed the entire All tournament. Time. So yeah. this is the this is the level that we're talking about that they're playing that we're sitting there going oh hey this is impressive they answer challenges I mean <laughs> I mean the the bar for what is now con- what constitutes a challenge for them is uh, is unlike any we've seen in recent years I think I, I agree with that I to go back to the where do they stand point there used to be sort of a a rule if you were going to win the title, you needed three NBA players slash three first round picks. And I think that shifted about 10 years ago. There was a run of like 15 years where only 03 Syracuse didn't have three first round picks as a national championship. I need you to jam Syracuse into this conversation somehow. <laughs> hey, we got Phil Booth in this conversation, <laughs> <It's> right? <fair. laughs> and Danny Hurley did do the, the Carmelo Anthony. He said yeah. he retired doing that after threes with Carmelo, which I thought was uh, an amusing little bit of impromptu humor uh, by uh, by someone who does that quite well uh, on the on the podium. Um, but I really think now, like, the, the way that college basketball has changed and the way talent distribution has changed, you need two great players and then elite complementary players and obviously a good system and scheme to uh, – to to fill uh, to to fill around it, but there was no point sitting there courtside where I was like, "We need to get a plan together in case UConn loses," because that would have been like right. the biggest yeah. story of the tournament. Like there was no point mm-hmm. where I was, uh, you know, I, I was doing a look at story. There was no point where I like started to hit delete or I started to be like, "Okay, like how will we how will we game plan this out?" It was just kind of like Donovan Klingon had a good quote after the game. He said, "We don't crumble and uh, they don't flinch." It was really like mm-hmm. the way I the way I looked at it with all the intensity of that game with all the carpet about the officiating with all the momentum swings and all the seven, what, 70% three point shooting by Alabama in the first half. Yeah. Uh, UConn was non flushed would be the best way to put it. You know, we, um, we threw, we tried to make sure we threw flowers to NC state um, mm-hmm. on sports center. And also I think Alabama too, because sort of along the same lines, now they limited the number of shot attempts that Mark Sears got, but we talk about a great job Castle did on him. Well, he shot better than fifty percent against Castle. He shot, I think, better than fifty percent against every defender they ran at him. They ran at least four, and two times he he was in transition. Guy scored twenty four points. He's six feet tall. Maybe I mean he he was, he was he was a warrior, absolute straight warrior tonight trying to keep them in that game. And, you know, UConn has more of those warriors. Not that – I mean, I'm not casting aspersions the way Alabama played. They played very hard. But, you know, I mean, that that level that UConn brings at you, it brings out the best in competitors. And even sometimes the best Mark Sears played great and it wasn't good enough. You know, that's that's probably, you know, probably the greatest compliment you can give – you know, to a team is that, you know, the other guy plays great and you still beat him. And, and I know everybody on their team didn't shoot you know, that well or didn't get the shots or the looks. But, you know, even when their star got what he did, because I sort of I sort of thought going into that game, I thought, you know what, because he's not a, the biggest guy in the world, they put Castle on him. You know, they might even heck, you know run different guys at him, which they did, Diara, whoever. And I said, they'll probably, you know, he might have a tough shooting night tonight. So if they stay in it, it'll be because, you know, Reitzel, Griffin, you know, one of the one of the young bigs keeps him in it, you know, hits a bunch of threes. But, you know, they none of the other happened. And Sears had worked for every single, you know, every single step he got, every dribble uh, was something he was working for. And, you know, he he delivered. But you've got to deliver a whole lot uh, to beat those cats. They're really, really something. Let's deliver some predictions, gentlemen. 
Uh, let's predict both title games um, and give a little synopsis. We could probably break down the men's more than more than the women's. I've other than mm-hmm. other than the officiating, I'm not qualified to to go too deep on the uh, <laughs> too deep on the women's. Uh, but let's uh, let's start with with, with Monday night. Uh, who and why, Jeff Porzello? I'll go with I'll go with UConn. I think they're going to go back to back. You know, like I said, I think Edie's going to get his, and I think UConn will probably be okay with that. And I just I, I just don't know if they have the firepower like we've discussed for the past you know five ten minutes. Is that no team has been able to go kind of blow for blow with UConn for more than four to five minutes or, or a half. Um, and so I, I go UConn 77, Purdue 71. And uh, mm. I'll go, I'll go Alex Caravan as the, as the X factor. Um, it just, he always seems to find himself open for kind of a transition back breaking three. And it just, it feels like he's got a couple of those in his, in his back pocket for Monday night. I go UConn 78, Purdue 65. Um Ooh. And I will. I'll say that. Um, I'll say that Tristan Newton uh, has has a big game. Control things defensively. Castle and Caravan get theirs, and and you know they offset Edie, who will be the guy who delivers most of the points. But UConn wins this comfortably, uh, I think, and and then brings Dan Hurley into wooden territory with multiple championships within his first twenty tournament games. He joins Stevens as guys with multiple championship game appearances. It'll be wooden if he wins with multiple titles within his first 20 tournament game. It's it's pretty heady company who has, in the last 60 years, won back-to-back NCAA tournament titles. It is Wooden, Krzyzewski, Donovan, good, and then huh? and then 40 minutes from, from Hurley joining them. And, uh, yeah, I, I I'm not going to be the be the outlier. I'm not going to embrace debate to pick Purdue here. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna take UConn. I will take them by a bigger margin than both of you. I am going to say seventy to fifty. I just don't think Purdue's guards 50? are in the same. Oh, oh no! I, I think, think yeah, Purdue's, oh. Purdue's guards are better than that, and they're they're right. much better than they were last year's freshman. Yeah, 50? Okay. 50? 50 is pretty low, man. <laughs> What if I said eighty to sixty? Would that make you feel better? Yeah, much better. I was just thinking of a twenty. I'm more on board with that. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Even if you said like seventy-seven fifty-seven or seventy-eight fifty-eight. I was just thinking of a twenty-point spread. Right. You thought about Virginia. Yeah. We were talking about Virginia before. That's why fifty stuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since you wanted me to host it, what do you think about the women's championship, Pete? You go first. Does South Carolina remain undefeated, or is it uh, Iowa and Caitlin Clark? I just think I'm going to ride the Caitlin band. Like, well, why not? Right? Like, just she's. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna roll. With, I'm gonna roll with Caitlin, and I'm going to say uh, they win by three. I don't want to put out a a, a point because I'll, I'll get I'll get criticized if I actually <laughs> put out a number. But uh, no, I, I think they. Uh, I think Iowa wins something like seventy two sixty nine. I will embrace debate. I'll go with South Carolina. Uh, I just. To me, they're they're a little bit similar to to UConn in the sense of you know when we talk about the star power. Uh, in the women's game, we don't often mention a, a South Carolina player in that conversation for this season, at least. I mean, they have a, a ton of tremendous players, but they just they overwhelm teams. I think they're beating teams by almost 30 points a game this season. They've been the best team, obviously, as an undefeated team from start to finish this season. So I, I can see the the corollary between them and UConn, and, and I think that they find a way to to slow down Kaylin Clark and, and uh, give Don Staley a championship, another one. My uh, my men's tournament bracket was tragic, although my champ my champion is still in the mix. And as it turns out, my women can we just pause bracket, for a second here? The, yeah. the two things that reset the most conviction on in our pre pod were yeah. Alabama's yeah. out of gas and don't and I was on the NC yeah. State don't take yeah. NC State too. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna own that, but we we have not busted his chops about that yet. So no, I just wanted to make sure. Don't, don't worry. I, I've, I've heard plenty from the locker room about that, okay. about the, uh, from the Alabama locker room about that. But, yeah, I had conviction about both of those things. It's not because I, I just thought NC State probably spent all of the emotional capital, yeah. and I thought Alabama would try. I mean, I thought Alabama was a good team, dangerous offensive team, who looked like they'd, you know, they'd gotten, gotten away from them. I was, I was wrong about that. I've been wrong about a lot of things in the men's tournament. think I'm going to get my champion right. But I – but my bracket, my bracket's pretty strong on the women's side, and from right. day one, it's had Iowa as as the champion. So I'm going to say that uh, for all of the people who love this silly debate about whether you have to be a champion to be great in a team sport and all that silly stuff, she'll get that. 
I will say that she scores 37 points. She ices the game with free throws at the end, and they win by four. And uh, and Iowa cuts down the nets and wins a national championship. How's that for specific predictions? Iowa by two safeties. By two Sorry. safeties. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> too soon. Too soon, the Hawkeyes say. They've, they've spent the winter entertaining you with high-powered offense and one of the uh, most gifted offensive players in basketball. And you have to go to the, to the offensive struggles on the football team. Thank you for uh, welcoming me and my loosened tie in uh, to the podcast late. You'll be you'll be uh, pleased to know, Jeff, perhaps as you go on the circuit, that I chastised Scott Drew today for the inappropriate sideline attire, which is the awful uh, quarter zips that these coaches yep. are wearing. I told Bruce I was sick of it, too. With Bruce, I said, I said, why don't you dress like you're dressed right now? And I don't know if you saw this. Pearl proceeded to say, oh, you want to see this? He starts unbuttoning his shirt. He started, I mean, he, I didn't see he, that. He, I saw him with the button up shirt. The, I didn't see him unbutton it. No, he had the fur flying a little bit there, but he said that he said <laughs> two butts. So as, as far as he would go, but uh, I, I'm I'm trying to do the Lord's work and get these guys dressed back appropriately. <laughs> so anyway, all right, guys, that was a lot all of right. fun. Thank you for listening to the College Game Day podcast immediately after the national semifinals in Glendale. We encourage you to subscribe or download wherever you prefer to get your podcasts.